Hey, there we go. Server side development and rock and roll. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi. Oh. Morning, everyone. Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. My turn to talk now. Okay. Time for software. Can you hear me? I'm going to start. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Hi, I'm Rasmus, CEO of Rounds, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about Rounds Analytics Pipeline and what we learned in the last two years trying to build and rebuild our analytic pipelines. I joined Rounds about two and a half years ago, and for the few companies, some of you probably may know, the Chuckle, Conf, and Janet, So, a little bit about Rounds. Rounds was founded about seven years ago. Our 35 person team. Uh, two thirds of us are in RD, most of the company, and Tel Aviv based. Actually, office is five minutes walk from here in Sahona in an old temple building. Uh, we raised up until now about $22 million from leading investors such as Sika Capital, Samsung Ventures, Verizon, Verizon, etc. And we've got about 25 million users worldwide. Uh, most of them in the US, Brazil, and uh, East Asia, mainly in Taiwan. This is a screenshot for, of our app. Basically, it's a video chat app. Uh, when we started, we had Facebook application, desktop application, all kinds of application around the social video chatting. Uh, in the last two and a half years, we were very much focused on the mobile. So this is our screenshots from one of our mobile apps. And basically you can do this uh, video chat with your friends one-on-one -on -one, or group video chat. During the chat you can scribble on each other, take pictures, play games against each other, watch YouTube together, synchronize movies. If you do fast forward on your, on your cell phone, the other party will also be fast forward, etc. So it's basically it's consumer app. Okay. These are the tools that uh, we're using. On the client side, we have a native application both on Android and iOS. So it goes without saying that we need to write Objective-C in Java. And uh, some C++ code, especially for the video rendering and the uh, handling. Uh, on the server side, um, traditionally, we're Python on top. Uh, but in the last year and a half, two years, I'd say, we're moving more and more towards Go. And more and more towards microservices architecture. Uh, we have C++ code, especially in our media server, that need to handle a lot of uh, video encoding, decoding, and transporting, and some bits and bytes of Erlang in our uh, Java DE servers. Uh, the database, we are using MySQL, uh, also the Amazon and our DS as a service, and moving more and more data into Couchbase. We have a few clusters for different applications. Each cluster is dedicated for an application, and we have a few clusters. We are very happy with its performance and its scalability. We're running on multiple clouds, Amazon traditionally, and then all our analytics stack is located at Google, and our media servers are spread around the world in software and digital ocean. For deployment, we use Ansible, and for monitoring, main, the main point of monitoring is Sensor, with a lot of custom checks. Checks, New Relic, and we use Victor Ops. If you're familiar with PagerDuty, Victor Ops is basically the same for incident management and our team. And yes, we use Docker in production. Not all of our services are Dockerized, but more and more are getting them. So, analytics. Like any consumer company, we wanted to know what are using are doing in the application, which part are good, which part are bad, how they are using it, and basically also this data has a value. So we tried to make it quite a few times. Uh, I think even before my time, we tried to use Panorama, and then we had vertical micro strategy, and we failed. We failed over and over again for numerous reasons. We failed from technical reason of choosing the right tools not doing the correct uh, submission of analytics, not doing the correct def definition of what event should be sent. And we failed also for personal reason. We are not sure that we had the right people to do the right job at that time. And I think we got it right this time. So at the beginning, a 
as I said before, we used the Python only shop, so we had one monolithic application written in Python with Django. I don't know why in Django we are only serving an API, no web, no user interaction on the server, but we had that. We had one application that actually the same code and the same servers and then put the API request from the user and also collect the analytics. Data was written into MySQL RDS, a different one, but each, each, each event was written row by row by row. So if I send in 20 events, I have 20 inserts and 20 connections to the servers. At the end of each day, we had a batch ETL that tried to load it into Vertica. And then came last summer. I had a boss in Finland a few years ago that used to say, success can kill us, and this is almost what happened to us. This is the graph from uh, the Google Play Store. And I'm referring not only to Android, but the same graph applied to, to iOS. This is our new installation. Of course, after the installation, there's registration, an active user, but you can see the numbers. We started on July 1st with about 2,000 daily new users. At the peak, we've been 80 times that much. Those users are new ones, so they are relating, so more and more users into the system, more and more users are using the system. Without any warning, it came to us by surprise, we didn't plan, we didn't do any marketing, so we didn't foresee it coming. We didn't have much time to prepare for that. We didn't have time at all. So, data collection basically killed our backend application. Since we got a lot of new users and we try to collect as much as that as we can. Every click of a button, any call flow, meaning I'm calling someone and reporting that the server getting this call, reporting that forwarded to the other client, reporting it. So a lot, a lot of reports. More reports than you actual user actions. And it's loaded and loaded our application server and basically killed them. And also, if the server weren't killed, at the end of the day, the ETL process went up to stars. There are a lot of data, and it was written very poorly, and it was crashing and losing data, etc. And even if, if everything worked correctly, we didn't have any real-time view into the system. We had, we had to wait at least at the end of the day, and then start the ETL process, and hopefully next morning, you knew what happened in the system yesterday. And this was a time of rapid changes, and this, is, this wasn't what we needed. So we made a call decision. We prefer that our user will be served, and we don't know what they are doing, so we killed the analytics. We just put an Nginx proxy in front of everything, and all the calls to the endpoint of the analytics return to the user immediately. So the, ser the user was served, but we didn't know anything. Basically, we were flying blind. So we need to start well, from scratch. So the first thing was to separate the data collection from the main application. So first we could release the version with the, of the client that points to a different uh, endpoint, to a different server, and we wrote our first Go code in production, a very naive version of just getting the data and putting it into a database, which was an elastic search database and it scales. First of all, it took off the load from our main Python application and Go, one of the things that I like, like to go, it scales very easily, especially for such a simple application. It's very easy to make it scale, it's fast. So that problem was solved. So the data was written into Elasticsearch cluster, and still at the end of the day, there's an ETL process to, up to upload the data from Elasticsearch to Vertica. This is the current architecture of what we have now. Basically, we divided the system, the collection system, into three parts. We have frontends, which receive the analytics directly from the clients or from our servers. And when I say from the servers, the analytics that we are serving, that are sent from them, are not CPU or, or network uh, metrics. We use the collective for that. This is only user-facing analytics, meaning if the server is involved in the call initiation process or reporting something to the user, then it logs it as an event. So the front end collect all the events, then they put them into a PubSub, a Google PubSub, we choose that as a service, 
and it's very easy to use, so you, you don't have to manage it. Uh, no scaling uh, issues and distributed across the Google Cloud. And we've got workers. Workers pull the event outside the PubSub and stream it into Google BigQuery and Elasticsearch. So the clients collect events on, on the devices and send them in batches, meaning that every <coughs> second it sends the batch, or if a threshold is reached, then we're sending the event even if the timeout is not passed. And of course, there are GZIP. Uh, G the front end does some very minimal uh, sanity check, versioning, etc., and return as soon as possible to the client with two, two accepted. There are two reasons that we want to return to the client as fast as we can. First of all, remember, we are talking about mobile devices. Network costs money and costs battery life. So we want to minimize the time that the device has leases. We can control it to spend on networking. So we are closing the connection as soon as we can. And also, if we close the connection as soon as we can on the server, which means that we, in terms of networking sources on the server side, we can serve more users. We get a balance those workers. They are located. We try to bring them as close to the user to minimize, again, the, net, the traffic and the network. And we push the analytics into the PubSub for future processing and mutation. And this is basically what is called the fanning model. A lot of writers will see it in part. OK, now here come the workers. They are, they are pulling the data from PubSub and you take and enrich the data, for example, adding a GIP resolution, etc., transforming if we need. I'll talk about later about bugs that we found that uh, we use this mutation in order to fix them, client part that we fixed here. Uh, and we're putting the database into different, sorry, we're putting the event into different databases. We have a few databases which serves different needs, monitoring, VI, warehousing, etc. And we have separation of concurrents, meaning we have cluster per worker type, meaning if the cluster of Elasticsearch uh, work or fail, it won't affect the, the cluster of the BigQuery fail. If the Elasticsearch is down, nothing will happen to those events that are scheduled to go to the BigQuery. Basically, the events go to two places. Tomorrow, if we said we want to move from BigQuery to Amazon Redshift, just write the worker and that's it, or adding another data storage. So if in the previous slide we talked about fair name model, this is fair name Okay, Staying into BigQuery. Uh, since we wrote it in uh, Go, uh, BigQuery supports streaming, but we haven't found any good library that uh, will accommodate our needs. So we decided to write the library of our own. And later on, the library was adapted by the BigQuery team, and they promote it whenever they talk. Also, the GoLang uh, team aware of it and loves this. Uh, Basically, you receive the load and stream it to BigQuery. You don't have to load job. As soon as you have something, you can stream it continuously. We support two types of stream, foreground, and wait for a, uh, a reply from the BigQuery, or do it in the background, ask, ask on key. Uh, data is available in, in, in seconds. As soon as the client sends it, it's in the, it's in the, it's in the pubs are pulled out, and after a minute or two, or even faster, you can already query it both in Elasticsearch and uh, in BigQuery. There are some cons to that. Error handling uh, is a bitch, especially if you're uh, doing async. And we're getting some server errors from uh, BigQuery from time to time, but lately things got much better. Uh, this package is open source. We love to get some PRs. Also, you can see on the uh, top right uh, the link to the open source project and below a blog post that we wrote about how we use that, the, and how we use this package and some of the design guidelines that uh, we have. Okay, this is a little bit about the deployment. As I mentioned uh, before, we try to deploy the, the default and as close to the user as we can. And then we had the question, where should we put the workers? We, the workers are written, as you remember, into BigQuery and to Elasticsearch. Since BigQuery is distributed across uh, the Google Cloud, it doesn't matter where the workers are. Elasticsearch is used for internal use. We are located in Israel. Traffic to Europe is a little bit faster than traffic to the US. We don't have to 
to pay to pay the traffic uh, inbound between cross sites. So we put the Elasticsearch cluster inside uh, Google in Europe, and hence we are the workers there. So this the, this the, this was the consideration when we did this. Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch is a great database. It's made in Israel, actually not exactly in Israel, but the founders and lots of developers are Israeli. Uh, we started to use Elasticsearch for monitoring uh, about a year before Elasticsearch themselves realized that they can use it as well for that. Uh, Elasticsearch basically it's a database for text searching, but we use it more as a time series based database and events. Uh, every new feature that is written by the RMD team and especially by the server team gets its new shining monitoring dashboard. We use it for debugging and we use it for monitoring our system We're using custom sensor check. For example, uh, we are checking every minute, every 30 seconds, no matter how many concurrent calls we have in the system. And during this check, and then we compare it against the median of the same time yesterday and the same time last week because those are daily and hourly trends and the trends by day of the week. So we can do the, this check using uh, our custom check against Elasticsearch. Data is kept there for between 30 to 90 days. It's more of a tactical data, it's not strategic data. In any case, the data is also in BigQuery. And we are using the other reporting using Kibana. If you're not familiar with Kibana, Kibana is the visualization, discovery, search, front end over Elasticsearch. A great tool which is getting better and better and better. Uh, this is a sample of dashboard that uh, we have. Uh, this is one of our registration dashboards. You can have summaries, you can have pie charts, you can have histograms, almost everything you want. And if you recall, we started when from with the vertical SAR database. We failed with that. I don't think the failure was because of vertical, but because we didn't have the skill, the mindset, and the people to do with it. So we started to use BigQuery. Basically, we're saving, storing data from the beginning until the end of time. One of the nice things at BigQuery is that you almost pay nothing for the storage. You pay only for query, querying the data. You're querying data with some sort of an SQL. It is very fast. You don't need a DBA to maintain it. And uh, if you do your partitioning correctly and write your queries with uh, the, uh, the mindset that one query can cost you a lot of money. Basically, you can bring the, the cost very down, very low. And we found out that we are using, we were paying Google for the entire degree less than we paid for the hardware that we maintain uh, vertical. And we grow much larger than we used to. Uh, we use the uh, Sysens for reports, another Israeli company. They have a great product. They just uh, about a month ago launched their the query connectors and we started using them. It's basically a Kibana. I don't know if it's insulting or not, but it's a Kibana for for the query. Uh, along the way, we found out some uh, some new issues. Uh, we need to decide whether we want to give flexibility or enforcement when creating events. Allow the client to to decide the format of the event or not. And clients make uh, make mistake. A recent one. Uh, about a month ago, we released a new application yeah. called Bula. It's basically a very fast, very easy video chat app on top of WhatsApp. In less than three or four weeks, we reach half a million users without any marketing. Uh, in the, one of the early versions of the iOS, there was a bug. If the client had an Arabic locale, then the event was set in Arabic digits and the Arabic calendars into the, data, into the event collector. Since it's an iOS, it takes time to roll out a new release, and we had to do some fixing on the server side. So that here come the workers. We issue just a new version of the workers. It took us a few hours that fix all the issues. And the data that we lost, we load it again from Elasticsearch, which, by the way, went well okay. So Elasticsearch, because it's more, it's, it's less formal, and less structure, uh, accepted those uh, Arab digits. The digital, uh, sorry, people really didn't. Uh, so we, we survive. Uh, we are looking at uh, currently at some sort of uh, schema validation. We are not sure if we want it, and we are not sure what is the tool, but we are considering. 
And we wrote a library, internal library for reporting events on the service. Okay. Thank you.